In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. One of the things we priests encourage you to do is to make a list of the hymns you would like played at your funeral. At the top of my list is, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. I wish I could tell you that it was from hearing it many times as a very popular hymn in the Baptist church where I grew up. Actually, that's not the case. Although we are not too penitential around Calvary during Lent, it is still the season of confession. I must confess that What a Friend We Have in Jesus became my favorite hymn when I heard it one night in a bar. <laughs> my sister told me there is this amazing folk singer-songwriter that you absolutely have to hear. Her name is Claire Holly. So we went to Howlin Mouse in Jackson, Mississippi one night. Claire sang an acoustic version of What a Friend We Have in Jesus that made me hear that hymn in a whole different way. Through the longing and the clarity in her voice and the pure simplicity of her acoustic guitar, I felt a closeness to Jesus that I never felt before. I felt a deep level of intimacy and trust knowing that I could bear my soul to him and knowing that he cares. I really felt he is my friend. Like many of our recent Lenten Gospel passages from John, today's is an especially long one. But embedded within it is the shortest verse in all the Bible, Jesus wept. Well, that's how I remember it from the King James Version. The New Revised Standard Version that we use translates it, Jesus began to weep, which begs the question, why would an Episcopalian use two words when four will do? Jesus wept when he saw the corpse of Lazarus, when he saw the tears of Mary, his brother, and those who gathered around her. The verse right after Jesus wept is very telling. The crowd says, see how he loved him. The word for love is not the expected agape, the selfless, self-giving love we associate with Jesus that appears throughout the writings of John. Instead, it is philia, the Greek word for the deep, affectionate love of one friend for another. We can see Philia as a lesser love than agape, but that, Jesus doesn't see it that way. A few chapters later, Jesus tells his disciples, I no longer call you servants, but friends. As he gets closer to his own death, to call his companions friends is the greatest love he can give them. Jesus often moves from the love of the particular to the love of universal. He comes to us as a particular person at a particular time. His self-giving love for all humanity is rooted in a life and a love that is profoundly personal and profoundly intimate. Joseph Scriven, who wrote What a Friend We Have in Jesus, knew all too well about profoundly personal and intimate love. On the night before his scheduled wedding, his fiancée drowned. In deep sorrow, Joseph moved from Ireland to Canada to start a new life. He fell in love with a girl named Eliza, and just weeks before they were to be married, she suddenly grew very sick and also died. Joseph turned to the only thing that anchored him in his life, his faith. He devoted himself to prayer, Bible study, and acts of service. He became known as the Good Samaritan of Port Hope, the little village where he lived. Ten years after Eliza died, Joseph received word that his mother in Ireland had become very ill. He didn't have the money to go be with her because he had given away nearly all he had to help others. So he sat down and wrote a letter to offer some comfort to her and included the words of his newly written poem that is really more of a prayer. That prayer became the hymn, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. 
Sometime later, when Joseph himself became ill, a friend found a copy of the prayer scribbled on a scratch piece of paper near his bed. After reading it, the friend asked, who wrote these beautiful words? Joseph replied, the Lord and I did it between us. Returning to our gospel passage, Jesus wept can seem like a brief interlude in which the humanity of Jesus bubbles up to the surface for a fleeting moment in a narrative built around revealing his divinity. But after hearing Claire Holley's version of what a friend we have in Jesus, I wonder if Jesus is shedding tears for his friend Lazarus is the ultimate sign of his divinity. Those tears are the signs of who God really is. The God who cares for us. The God who deeply loves us. The God who is moved to unbind us and give us new life. The God who longs to be our friend. The God who weeps over us and who weeps with us. As we more and more see the world around us through the eyes of Jesus, we too are often moved to weep. Our tears are not only signs of our humanity, but are the signs of our participation in Jesus' divinity. The tears we shed join his tears in becoming the seeds of new life. The words of the hymn, written by a couple of close friends, Joseph Scribner and Jesus, who shared each other's tears, and whose hymn was brought to new life for me by Claire Holly, are these. What a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear, all because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Can we find a friend so faithful who will all our sorrows share? Jesus knows our every weakness. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Are we weak and heavy laden, cumbered with a load of care? Precious Savior, still our refuge, take it to the Lord in prayer. Do thy friends despise, forsake thee, take it to the Lord in prayer. In his arms he'll take and shield thee, thou wilt find a solace there. <laughs>